announcements. First, if you haven't signed up for the golf outing, you are invited to do so. That is going to be the charity golf course scramble on June 18th, and that is coming rapidly. So please take note of that. I really don't have any other announcements to make this morning, so that's the announcement for today. We don't have any, we don't have any flowers on the altar or um, worship guide sponsors, so let us center ourselves and begin our worship with our morning prelude. Holy Spirit, with astonishment, we see that you renew our strength constantly. Adversity, and in our turn, we will renew your gratefulness, and we will sing for your love. Amen. Our opening hymn is Shaping Spirit, Move Among Us.
Let us all join together in a prayer of gathering. Let us pray. God, the Holy Spirit, you are the restless breath of love that sweeps through the world. You move where you will, breaking down barriers, stirring hearts to change, making all things possible. Inspire each one of us to hunger and thirst for justice. Come, Spirit of God, sweep through our world, bringing great change. May the bounty of your goodness be shared more justly, so all may share in the rich blessings of your creation. And for us, bring transformation in our praying and living so that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you all the days of our lives. Amen. Surely the presence. So Ken is on vacation. Now let me tell you about Ken. He has been working here at church all this time. He also was going to seminary full time and finished a week ago his second year. Um, Ken was really tired and he also is going to be um, going to camp for nine days in June. He's going to be there. We have kids from our church going to all three camps and so Ken is going to be there um, for nine days. He's going to be gone a stretch of June. And after June, something else is happening, and he's thinking he's going to be really busy. So he's taking a couple of weeks off, very well deserved. But I don't have a bag of wonders, but I do have a cool item. Today is Pentecost, and Pentecost in the church talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is sort of a presence that drives us and invites us and challenges us all the time. Now, when we try to do things in the church without the Holy Spirit, we can hold this up. And how exciting is this thing? Anybody really sitting back saying, wow, what you're holding in your left hand is the most exciting thing I've seen all day. Anybody? One person. Okay. But when you add the Holy Spirit to the life of the church, God connects with us. And it becomes really interesting. Now, is this the coolest thing you've seen today so far? Isn't that cool? You take away the Holy Spirit, and it stops. Add the Holy Spirit, and the church is alive and well. So... The Holy Spirit is really important to us and challenges us and gives us power to make the world an exciting place. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, for bringing us together, and we thank you for all the children who participate in the life of the church. 
and you remind us that we are all your children. Bless us this day and all days. Amen. And all to all the children who are at home watching this, stay good and be good because Ken will come back.
Good morning. Today's scripture is from the Gospel according to John, chapters 15, verses 26 and 27, and chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now or bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine, and declare it to you. And now, a reflection, many things to say, by Reverend John E. Manzo. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The Christian church year has three major holidays, so to speak. Christmas. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. Easter. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus being raised from the dead. Pentecost is today, and Pentecost is about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Christmas, of course, is a massive holiday that is both religious but increasingly secular in nature. In nature. Most of society is focused on Santa Claus, decorations, gifts, and parties more than it is about the birth of Christ. Easter, well, a lot of Easter has become a secular holiday too, and it's become more about coloring Easter eggs getting candy in the Easter Bunny than it is about the resurrection of Jesus. But both of those days are big days in the life of the church. Pentecost is not a secular holiday. It's something that we strictly do in churches, and for many it goes by pretty much unnoticed, often even in church. One of the things that makes Pentecost very different from Christmas and Easter is that Christmas and Easter are set one-time actions. Jesus is born once. Jesus is raised from the dead once. But Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, reminds us that we as God's people are in constant conversation with God, who is present in our midst with the Holy Spirit. Or maybe better said, it says that we ought to be in constant conversation with God. God is often speaking to us. We're not always listening. 
Today's scripture reading is from Jesus' final or farewell discourse in John's Gospel. This entire narrative goes from chapters 14 through 17, and there is nothing at all like it in the entire Bible. It is a commentary given by Jesus opening his heart and totally sharing with us what God is like and how we are connected to one another. This entire discourse is both comforting and challenging, reminding us of our connection with God and to one another, but also an invitation to growth in the spirit. In what we read today, Jesus teaches us a bit about the Holy Spirit. His words, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them now. Those words are powerful. There is so much to learn about God and faith, we cannot handle everything at once. It is like trying to get a drink of water out of a fire hydrant. There is so much, there is so fast, that comes by so fast, it's very difficult to take a sip. It's a vivid reminder that our faith is a faith journey. And every day, if we're on this journey, we take another step. I wanted to share today two things I learned about the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. For those of you who were afraid reading the sermon title, Many Things to Say to You, I've narrowed it down to two things this morning. You're welcome. Two things I've learned about the presence of God and the Spirit in my life. The first thing is that God is a God of love and mercy and a God of love and mercy that is beyond our comprehension. And God often sends people in our lives to model what that means. An old man met a young man, and the young man said to the old man, Sir, do you remember me? The old man said, No. And the young man said, When I was a student, you were my teacher. And the old man said, well, that's great. He goes, what did you do in your life, young man? And he said, well, I became a teacher because you, sir, inspired me to become a teacher. You are the one person who changed my life in ways that I cannot ever totally thank you for. The old man sat down on the park bench and he said, how did this happen? What did I do? The young man sat down and he said, one day a friend of mine who was also a student came in with a nice watch. I decided I wanted that watch. So I stole it. I took it out of his pocket. Not too long afterwards, my friend noticed his watch was missing and he complained to the teacher, which there happened to be you. And then you stood up in front of the class and said, a student's watch was stolen during classes today. Whoever stole it, please return it. Well, I didn't give it back because I really liked the watch and I wanted it. So you closed the door, sir, and told us all to stand and form a circle. You were going to search our pockets one by one until the watch was found. However, you told us to close our eyes because only you would look for the watch while we had our eyes closed. We did as you instructed and you went from pocket to pocket. And when you went through my pocket, you found the watch and you took it. But you kept searching everyone else's pockets. And when you were done, you said, open your eyes, we have the watch. You didn't tell on me, and you never mentioned the episode. You never said to anyone who stole the watch. That day you saved my dignity forever. I have never been more ashamed of myself than I was that day. It was the most shameful day of my life. But sir, that is the day I decided not to become a thief, not to become a bad person. You never said anything to me, nor did you ever scold me. You never took me aside to give me a lesson, but I got the most profound lesson of all. I received your message clearly, and I decided I wanted to be like you. 
Thanks to you, I understood what a real educator needs to be like. Professor, do you remember that day? The old professor said, yes, I remember the situation with the stolen watch. I remember looking in everyone's pocket. I didn't remember you because I, too, kept my eyes closed while I was looking. This, he said, is the essence of teaching. If to correct, you must humiliate. You don't know how to teach. When I first heard this story or read this story, my first thought is, this is the way God teaches us to treat one another, to be with one another, with mercy and love not to humiliate each other. We learn this over and over again, or we read this over and over again in the Bible, from praying, from allowing the Holy Spirit to actually speak to us and with us actually listening. The lesson is there always, love and mercy, love and mercy. That day, for that young man, he learned it. For us, it's an ongoing challenge. The second thing is this. The Holy Spirit leads us into something of a paradox. Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church. I'm not always enthusiastic with that. While it's partially true, it's not really totally true. After Pentecost, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the apostles went forth and brought Christianity into the world. And Christianity was less a religion than it was a movement, and it prospered despite intense persecution. The problem that Christianity had was it was chaotic, and Christians argued with one another, with one another over who they were and what they believed in. Can you believe that? Christians argued with one another with one another over who they were and what they believed in. Thankfully, that never happens anymore. There were at the time many books in the, Old, in the New Testament, but there was not an established Bible. There were actually more books that people were reading from than we have now. All churches have worship traditions, and they all had worship traditions, but they were also vastly different from one another. Early Christianity was chaotic and disorganized, but wildly effective. People were turning to Christ in droves. Then something happened in Christianity. In the year 312 AD, the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. And in 325, he called a meeting in Nicaea where he demanded everyone get on the same page. And the Christian church was organized using the same model as the Roman Empire, with a person called the Pope being the emperor, the Roman Senate being the College of Cardinals. The Roman Catholic Church still maintains this structure to this day. Christianity developed creeds, put together the canon of the Bible, rituals, and traditions that we still participate in now to this day. And Christianity in the year 325 became an institution and fixed things in place. That became, in many ways, the second birthday of the church. And in some ways, many people would say the real birthday of the church. Now, here's the good news. The good news was that in the early Christian church, now there was uniformity and divisions were put aside for a while. There was a consistency of doctrine using the same Bible was great and getting rid of Roman persecution was wonderful. So whereas Pentecost was the birthday of the church and getting people moving, the Council of Nicaea in 325 was the birth of the institutional church. Now you're wondering why I'm telling you all of this because this brings us to the paradox of the Holy Spirit and the church. In many ways, the Holy Spirit is the worst enemy of the institutional church. The Holy Spirit brings change and often chaos, forcing movement, and institutions by their very nature aren't designed or desirous to move a whole lot. 
On the other hand, without the institutional church, we would devolve into chaos. To survive, the Christian church needs to be an institution. To be totally faithful to God, it needs to be a movement and not an institution. And therein, of course, is the paradox, which brings me to my point. Sometimes Christianity is diminished by boiling it down to something overly simple. For example, the phrase I hear more than any other is that what Christianity wants us all to be, being a Christian is being nice to, nice to people. If we are good-hearted, we're often referred to as Christian. And we often label behavior as Christian or not Christian. That is not necessarily what Christianity is. Those are behaviors that are expected of Christians, but non-Christians do them as well. Christianity is actually defined by having faith in Jesus Christ and attempting to live in a way that Jesus taught us. This includes praying, reading the Bible, being, participating in ritual, participating in sacraments, as well as the kindness. And it requires so often a church, an institutional church, to bring us together. On the other hand, we always have to be open to the wind of the Spirit, constantly blowing through and demanding us to change and to grow. The United Church of Christ has a motto that says, God is still speaking, which is a really old premise in our denominational tradition. It goes all the way back to the pilgrim's pastor, John Robinson, a forebearer of our denominational tradition when he said, God hath more light and truth to break forth on his holy word. The premise of a still speaking God in our tradition is not new. It goes all the way back to 1620 when John Robinson said these words. These words, this idea of God still speaking is baked into our tradition. It goes all the way back to the origins of our faith family. And it is a reminder to us that we need always to be attuned to listening to the Holy Spirit. When I hear those words, God is still speaking, these are the words to me that we need to shout from the mountaintop because they are, they are, in my opinion, the most important words of Pentecost. They are profound words of our tradition. They are part of what drives us. They are a reminder to us that the Holy Spirit is in conversation with us and that God is still speaking. And then we are challenged and we are invited to listen. Amen. We have several people to pray for. We continue to pray for David Cox and Arthur Olemacher, Eileen O'Bannon, Eleanor Cox, Angela Robinson, Charlotte Carter, Helen Knopfmeyer, Kathy Cano. Char Sands has asked to be put on the prayer list. Char was diagnosed with breast cancer this past week. And so she is about to go on to the journey for treatment for breast cancer. So we keep Char and, and Mike in our prayers. Sandy Boofter's sister, Ronnie, is, is having a lot of serious, serious health problems. And we, so we pray for Ronnie and her entire family. Lane Stumler asked me to pray. He said the church council has appointed a task force for recommendations for dealing with the homeless situation that we're seeing around St. Mark's. This is obviously a very difficult undertaking and this task force is asking that we pray for the homeless, endeavor, the homeless task force for their success in their endeavors and pray for all those homeless folks who are seeking shelter. Let us pray. Creating, beckoning, loving God, we ask for heightened attentiveness that you are with us, within us, 
and beyond us. We pray that you never give up on us. We acknowledge that we are a stiff-necked people who get stuck without ever intending it. So now we breathe, into your trans we breathe in your transforming and life-giving spirit and celebrate that you prod and lure us to adventures and living in ministry that are beyond what we can imagine. Listen to our hearts and longings for the healing of our suffering world. Please add our own intentions as we pray in silence before God. Knowing, good God, that you are hearing us better than we are speaking, we offer these prayers in all the holy names of God as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During the time of offering, we're invited to drop an offering at the, at the end of worship in the back or send it in to the church either online or by mail. We also take this time of offering to think about how um, we can take time to listen to God. Take time maybe to pray each day, a few minutes each day, and try to sit in silence and pray for God to speak to us. Okay, I invite everybody to stand up and turn and face each other and say hello. Hello. So what's happening? Hello. Hello. Let us commission each other. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated for our final hymn, like the murmur of a dove song. Thank you. Like the murmur of the dove song, like the challenge of her flight, like the vigor of the wind's rush, like the new flame's eager might, come home. healing of division with a ceaseless voice of prayer with the power to love and witness with a peace beyond compare come Holy Spirit As we gather for Holy Communion, first, does everybody have one of the little communion packets? If you do not, could you please um, 
Stand up or raise your hand and the ushers will bring you one. Do you have them back here? Janet, do you have them? Yeah. Okay. Yes, have them. After communion is over and we're after the communion and the benediction and the benediction response um, communion will be right before we'll participate in it right before the benediction you're invited to take uh, the cup that you have and drop it and you'll notice in all the windows there are little baskets we ask you to dispose of them in there let us come together let us come together with a sense of solemnity and seriousness and recognize what a tremendous privilege it is to be invited to God's table. And let us also recognize that we are all invited to God's table. No one is left out. Holy God, we are not sure what it would be like if the Holy Spirit blew through our churches again as the Spirit did on Pentecost. However, we want to speak the language that you have given louder and more clearly in our lives and church. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Pour out your fire of love upon us to be the body of Christ in a world often hurting, hungry, and cynical. We want to bring good news to the poor Heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, bringing recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty all that are bruised. As your disciples, we pray for all who suffer, are poor, despairing, burdened, blind, and battered. In your loving breeze, we pray for the health and wholeness of those who are physically ill, those who are mentally ailing, those who are poor in spirit, for those who feel spiritually broken. We pray for the healing of your creation and the renewal of the face of the land. We pray for those who are thirsty, that they would drink from your fountain of living waters and never thirst again. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread in his hands and he broke the bread and he gave it to those around him and said, take this and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. When the supper was ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praised you and gave the cup to his friends and those around him saying, Take this and drink, for this is my blood, which is shed for you and all people everywhere. Whenever you do this, remember me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is now ready. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ, which is broken for us. Take and drink, for this is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, which was shed for us. Let's rise for the benediction. Let us go forth with God's blessing and be aware that the Holy Spirit is loose among us. Be careful. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always
is at your back. The sunshine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until 